Okay, so reading from Luke 15, 1 to 3, and then 11b to 32, the parable of the lost sheep to start. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was a young man who had two sons. The young one said to his... <clears throat> said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms round him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he, is, he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a, goat, even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Interesting lectionary reading for Mothering Sunday, isn't it? A parable that focuses on the son and a father. But the title for this morning is A Mother's Embrace. A mother's embrace. Why not a father's embrace? Because it is a parable in which the father, as the God figure, is showing, displaying the heart of God in how he reacts to his young son's return. So why a mother's embrace? As many as, a, as, many as us are realising, God is much more than male. Shock horror for some, perhaps in the world, but God is much more than male. God the Father is a metaphor, and one way God has chosen to reveal God's self. But God is not that bearded, Gandalf-like white man. Again, that might be news to some people. Again, think about Jesus from the earlier reading in Luke, when Jesus describes himself as a mother hen wanting to gather the people of God together, in the way that God is like a mother hen in that. Think about the Holy Spirit in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, Ruach, the name for the spirit, breath, is a female word. So that's partly why this morning we have the title, A Mother's Embrace, but primarily because I'm going to be specifically reflecting on how church often described as mother, albeit another metaphor, is called to be like this loving God we see reflected through the Father's love in this parable for his wayward son. A mother's embrace. 
So, it's all about how church, how we can learn to be more like God in how God embraces the word used by Jesus through Luke, sinners and tax collectors. That means everybody, sinners and tax collectors, including, and this is the point that Jesus is making to the muttering Pharisees and the lawmakers, or the teachers of the law, They were put out because Jesus was mixing with the likes of us, sinners and tax collectors. You are to be more like God. The God who embraces those often regarded by the religious as unworthy and less than. As Riley said earlier, the brilliant foxes, the wonderful snakes and the beautiful spiders... So to start with, how can church, mother church, how can church be more like God in being outward focused? Notice in this parable what God, through looking at what the Father is like in the parable, is like. There's no brooding of the Father in the parable about the choices and the behaviour of his younger son. But on the other hand, the father hasn't forgotten his son either. He hasn't given up his son as a bad lot. He hasn't started turning inwards and getting on with business as usual. No, the father, picture it, is constantly looking to the horizon. We know that because he saw his son when he was a long way off. The father was scanning. The father was attentive, looking, yearning. Opposite to out of sight, out of mind. This is a fantastic picture of what God is like. Not scowling, not thinking, whatever next will they get up to? And for you this morning, for me, this is and has always been the way God looks at you and looks at every single person. Churches, don't we know it, have often majored in scowling, in tutting. And that holier-than-thou attitude, meant to be holy, that's something different to holier-than-thou. And to be fair, to be fair to church and to us, it's ever so easy for us, for churches, to become inward-focused, to become a bubble, because bubbles feel quite nice to become that holy huddle that's cut off from the rest of the world. And it happens slowly, slowly, slowly without our even realising it. It becomes about what music I like, what I get out of church, what events church is putting on for me, for us. How is church caring for me? Jeff Lucas uses the word, doesn't he, or the phrase, the frozen chosen. I love that. The frozen chosen. Have you noticed this as well? I think this is really key. Lots would disagree with me, but I think it's true. How churches often seem to teach that the world out there, that awful world out there, is totally out of step with God. We look down upon them and we say, whatever next? But sometimes it's the isolated, self-focused church, Christians, that have become out of touch with God and how God is actually working in the world. God is often controversial. God is often working within and through those who don't even identify as Christians. And Christians who have disengaged with church because they have found church thinking antiquated. Such people are often more inclusive and less prejudiced. Sometimes better at looking out for the marginalised. More like the father in the parable. Yes, ouch, cringe. It's often church that has become like the older brother who represents the Pharisees in this. Jesus is talking about the older brother because he's talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. 
looking upon people. We can look upon people with judgment. We can become proud, not too obviously proud because that would be ugly, but proud all the same of our rule keeping, our self-righteousness, our religiosity. Maybe, I wonder how many Christians would admit to this, maybe even jealous, suspecting that people outside of the church are having more fun. What's the answer? Humility? Our repenting? Turning round? Changing our thinking? Throwing the doors wide open, or as we often say, blowing them off their hinges? And also being more loving and open in our daily lives. This is key. Eyes open, hearts open. The good news in all of this, I believe, is that it's happening more and more. God's Spirit, the Ruach, the breath of God, is breathing upon us, upon churches. And some of us are becoming more and more open and malleable, trusting of the Spirit. What about, secondly, becoming a mother church full of compassion? The father saw the son, and we hear from Luke, was filled with compassion for him. In this parable, you can just sense the heart of God bursting for us through the heart of the father bursting for his returning son. Something that reflects the joy in God's heart when we turn around to look at God. That simple thing, turning to look at God. When we start walking towards God and when we start walking with God. Both perhaps that initial time, that tentative time, but also if we choose on a daily basis. Again, because it's beautiful and precious. Notice God's non-judgmental attitude. The younger son, I love this, the younger son had rehearsed his speech. Sorry, Dad, I've sinned against you, I've sinned against God. Just make me a servant. But the father doesn't even wait for the son to utter any words of apology. He embraces his son before a word is spoken. And this is after he has already run towards his son. Something which for an older man in a patriarchal society was very, very humiliating, hoiking up the garment and running. But he didn't worry about that because his focus was on the other. God's just like that with you with me, with us, with everybody. In church, within the people who make up church, there is often compassion in our hearts and our actions. The call is to grow in this. And even more for people who might be seen as different to some of us, whose lifestyles might be different to some of ours. People we might not always understand. That's our limitation, not theirs. Are not shying away from people who are different, but looking to, looking out for through those doors, and yes, running towards them. Not in a scary way. Have you ever been to a church or anywhere where somebody runs towards you and you feel like running? I've been there. <laughs> but metaphorically, running towards people in simple ways. It doesn't have to be clever. Getting to know people in our daily lives. And within church, this is so simple but so hard. Mixing with people after the service who we don't know. Who are slightly different to us, perhaps. And this is the key thing. As with the Father, church is not being conditional in our welcoming. As Riley mentioned, not having a ceiling, you are welcome so far, but then stop, get back. Hey, hey, wait, you've got to change before you can come nearer and nearer, before we can embrace you fully. We are to be all embracing. Notice that the smell of pigs doesn't put the father off hugging his son. 
This is absolutely shocking to those hearing this parable. Because mixing with pigs for the Jewish people. And the son had the stench because he was working with, eating the same food as, or tempted to. But the father hugs him just the same. Don't you love this picture and what it means about God's embrace for us? It reminds me of my return from Kenya about 15 years ago, maybe. And I'd been out there with a group of people from Upper Beading Baptist Church and we'd been teaching and preaching and doing building and all that kind of thing and uh, taking water pumps and helping with that in the middle of nowhere in Kenya. And for two weeks I was washing in dirty rivers and even the shower we hung up, you came out more dirty than you went in. Well, I came back from Kenya thinking I had a really good suntan. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. But I remember Kate and my daughters, my young daughters at that stage, scrubbing me in the bath and my suntan disappeared. But my dirtiness did not put them off hugging and embracing me. A more beautiful picture is when our middle daughter, Sophie, came back from Peru a few years ago. And she'd been all out doing some wonderful stuff uh, with her volunteering and in the Amazon and, yeah, scary stuff. But I still have that picture in my mind of Kate embracing her at Heathrow Airport. A mother's embrace. So precious. It's a picture of God embracing us. And how Mother Church, we are to be with everyone. Again, this is so different to how the Pharisees and the older brother were reacting to Jesus. They're focusing on morality, behaviour, being judgmental. Remember, we are the physical arms of God. We are the physical arms of God. We are the ones to embrace. We are the ones to offer hands of help. We are to be God's huggers. Again, that's a metaphor, not always literal. If you try and hug some people, you will scare them half to death. And for good reason. Some people have been abused. Some people just don't want to be hugs. But metaphorically, we are to be that. Embracing everyone, not being choosy. What about being joyful? Celebration is at the heart of this parable and the two that came before it about finding the lost sheep and the lost coin. It is at the heart of God, again, unlike the older brother and the Pharisees. And for us as Mother Church, it's not begrudgingly accepting people in some kind of pious way. I deign to include you. Aren't we doing well because we are very inclusive? It's a genuine celebration, a genuine joy, a genuine affirmation of who comes through that door, who they are. In the early church, so they would have been spoken to by this parable, the Jewish people within the church had trouble accepting the Gentiles, the non-Jews, because they hadn't been brought up with all their rule-keeping. But today... Other individuals, other groups have not always been welcome in church, have not always been safe, have been damaged by church. But, again, good news, good news alert. <laughs> this is changing, I believe, starting to change in many churches. And why is it changing? Because of the Ruach, the breath of God, and our being receptive and open and trusting to the breath of God, even though others might say, oh, what are they doing Sometimes it is not people outside of church that needs to repent, but churches change our thinking, change our attitude, change our direction. And then, as our hearts reflect the heart of God, isn't this good news? More and more and more, we will exude joy. So different to being religious. Try to say this without a critical heart as observation, but I've come across so many Christians who look and sound so heavy, so serious, so joyless. And I'm not talking people who are depressed or clinically depressed, but I've even known people, none of you, <laughs> I've even known people within churches who have counted the hours 
on a sheet that they have done for the church. I have known many who have got a nose out of joint because they don't feel appreciated. We're a very thankful church, genuinely. But as Christians, we can often feel unappreciated, and it's about us. Sometimes Christians within churches, they don't celebrate the new people coming in, but they get jealous of all the attention they're getting. I actually feel for the older brothers, because it must be so hard to be the older brother, older sister. And thankfully, what I see before me in this church, this is true, is your joy when new people come to this church. Last thing I want to focus on, and I get excited about this bit. Mother Church, we are to be loving, yet not perfect. As a father, I feel so relieved. I felt so relieved when I found out I wasn't called to be the perfect father. And I remember a psychotherapist telling me that actually when your daughters, for me, my daughters, end up taking the mickey out of you and joking at all your faults, actually that's really healthy. I wish it wasn't. <laughs> it happened a lot. <laughs> Mothers, fathers, parents can be smothering. Children can become too dependent on a parent. Sometimes a child has an unhealthy idealisation of their mother, their father, their carer. Sometimes this can actually, ironically, end up in a lack of self-belief, a lack of trusting other people. They will never measure up to my father or my mother. And it can happen in churches too, with Mother Church. People often want the perfect church and feel very disgruntled when they notice something not quite right about the church. Or people can become, I've seen this so many times, I think maybe it was more in the past, dependent on church, for friends, for care, for social life. For everything. It's Winnicott, who was a psychologist in the last century, who spoke about the good enough mother. Groundbreaking work. And it's when we have an imperfect parent that as children, actually, we can learn to love ourselves, to love others, to become healthier. Listen to this quote. I love this. Please listen and be encouraged. Every time we don't hear them, the children, calling us right away, every time we don't give them our undivided attention, every time we feed them a dinner they don't want to eat, every time we make them share when they don't want to share, we are getting them ready to function in a society that will frustrate and disappoint them on a regular basis. Children need to learn in small ways, every day that the world doesn't revolve around them, that their every request won't be honoured and that their behaviour impacts other people. They need to learn through experience that life can be hard, that they will feel let down and disappointed, that they won't always get their way, and despite all of that, or perhaps because of it, they will still be okay. If our children never have these experiences and if their every need is met every time, they will have no ability to manage the challenges that will inevitably arise. They won't learn that it's okay to feel bored or annoyed or sad or disappointed. They won't learn time and time again that life can be painful and frustrating, but they'll get through it. In short, building our children's resilience is the gift of the good enough mother, father, parent, caregiver. Mother Church, we're not to rest on our laurels, but we're never going to be perfect. It's about being a good enough Mother Church. This came to mind as well. I think a healthy parent is one who is open to learning, that doesn't know it all, 
where a parent's convictions can change through listening to their children, to the younger generation, to acknowledge, actually, I'm not perfect, I'm just good enough, I hope, but I don't know it all. Question for you to ponder after today. Did God learn anything through his son, Jesus, coming and walking this earth and dying on the cross? Or did God know it all already? Did God learn the pain of loss more so he can empathise? Did God learn what sacrifices even more? Did God learn through the death and resurrection? I have, I've often said this, but it's true. I've learnt so much through listening to my children. So much. And it hasn't always been easy. But I've learnt so much from them. Mother Church... Are we open to learning from new people coming through the doors and not pretending, ah, you've come here, well done, we've got all the answers. From those beautiful foxes. Are you up for growing in love together? Let me draw this together. A mother's embrace, a father's embrace, God's embrace. Three characters in the parable. The father the older son, the younger son. I don't know if you agree, I think we all have the three in each of us. Every church has all three within them. Which will you choose to be more and more? Who will you let the spirit, the ruach, the breath of God develop in you more and more? I love the fact that it's not the end of the story for the older brother. We don't know if he joined the party eventually. It's never the end of a story for the church. It's never the end of a story for you. However old, however long you've been a Christian, your faith can come more and more alive. Amen.